What is going on guys? Welcome to the Ultimate AI 900 Study Guide. Today we're gonna to be taking a little bit deeper dive into the different topics that I think are really valuable to know and are gonna be on the exam. My name is Griffin Lickfelt and this is the Citizen Developer Channel. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment down below. If you did not have a chance to check out my overview video, I'm gonna recommend you go watch that first before this one. You can click the link here. That is gonna to begin to introduce some of the topics we're covering deeper today. Roll the intro. Before we introduce the topics, I just want to say that I'm not going to recommend for this video to be your only source of study for the certification. I'm still going to recommend that you, after this video, you go read through the Microsoft Learning Modules and then do practice problems before your exam. But I can tell you, you're in the right place to start. This video is not going to cover absolutely everything that is going to be contained in those learning modules. But after I took and passed the exam, I found that there were definite trends in what a lot of the questions were related to, and those topics we're gonna cover today. The three main topics I wanna cover today is gonna be the AI workloads, the AI principles, and then Azure Open AI services. So let's get right into the workloads. There's gonna be four main workloads that are covered on the AI 900, and that's gonna be machine learning, computer vision, natural language processing, and knowledge mining. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is going to be trying to create predictions. It's going to be looking at previous data, whether it's numerical or not. And it's going to be trying to make accurate predictions in the future of what the potential output would be. Azure Machine Learning Service is a cloud-based platform that's going to be used to create, design, test, and publish your AI models. This is all going to be done in the Machine Learning Designer. And I'm not going to cover what this is in detail because I didn't personally find a lot of questions relating to it on the exam, but this is gonna be an interactive space where you can design, create, and test these models. So what are the four main models? The main models are gonna be regression, classification, clustering, and then anomaly detection. Regression is gonna be trying to look at past numerical data to predict a numerical future. The best example I can think of this is the stock market. You're going to be looking, the module is going to be looking at trends to try to figure out, okay, what is the most likely prediction, the most likely place where this is going to be in the future. Once you build and test your model, you're going to get some metrics on how well it did, some scoring metrics. And these can be the root mean squared error, the relative squared error, or a coefficient of determination. There are a couple on that list, but let me tell you a little study hack. All of these abbreviations that relate to regression start with an R. So the coefficient of determination is R squared. The root mean squared error is RMSE. There's no other metrics that relate to other machine learning types if they don't start with an R. The next model is gonna be classification. Classification is gonna be trying to look at a, each data point and try to classify that data point to a specific, well, class. You'll most likely get a question relating which option would this record fall in. If you see anything related to a Boolean, an option set, a pick list, the answer to that is probably going to be classification. As an example, imagine you're a teacher and you have all this different data about each one of your students. A classification model is going to be able to predict whether each student, say, passes or fails. It could even be a multi-choice option set. So this classification model could potentially spit out what actual letter grade they will get. It will give them a classification, something on that option set, it'll give it a label. After testing your classification model, it's gonna give you a confusion matrix. Why it's called that, I don't know. It's confusing, right? The confusion matrix is gonna add each one of your data points to one of these four boxes, whether it's actually true, actually false, predicted true, or predicted false. Each one of these squares is gonna get a number. It's gonna be a count of the amount of records that fit into that category. The example the learning module uses, and I think is helpful to understand this, is gonna be a hospital with patients. And you test all of your patients, and then the classification model is trying to classify whether the patients were sick or not sick. So this top left square, true positive, is gonna show the count of amount of records that the model predicted the patient was positive and the patient was actually positive. The bottom right square is the true negative. This is gonna be the count of the amount of records that the model predicted the false and the patients were actually false. These two squares are gonna be where you want more numbers because these are suggesting the model was correct. The other squares are gonna suggest the model was wrong. 
This bottom left square is the false negatives. This is gonna be where the model predicted that the patient was not sick, but they actually were. The negative on their test was false. The false positives in the top right, this is gonna be where the model predicted or classified that the patient is sick, but in fact they were not. It is a false positive. That one for me is the easiest to remember, and then I kind of build all of the other ones off of that. I hope this makes sense. Like I said, it's a confusion matrix. Moving on to the next model, we have clustering. And clustering is gonna be kind of tricky with classification. Clustering is going to break your data into segments. The differentiator between clustering and classification is that clustering is not necessarily going to apply a label to it. It's not going to say, hey, these are our healthy patients, these are our sick patients, here's our passing students, here's our failing students. All it's going to say is that this group of students, this group of patients have similar inputs. This group has similar inputs and so does this group. A good example of when this might be used in the real world is you might use a clustering model to segment your customers for marketing analysis. Or say you want to separate your customers based off geographical locations so that you can split them into regions. This would be effective using clustering. The last machine learning module is anomaly detection. And this one I think is fairly straightforward. The example I used in my previous video is when, say when you're out of the country, if your credit card were to get swiped, you get a text from your bank. This anomaly detection is gonna be looking at your previous data and trends, and if something were to fit outside of the standard deviation of your typical information, then it's going to alert the anomaly detection model. That is gonna wrap up our machine learning workloads, but now let's get right into the next one, computer vision. Computer vision is gonna interpret the world and make predictions based off inputs from cameras, videos, or photos. Computer vision is gonna have four main workloads as well, and that's gonna be computer vision, custom vision, face, or document intelligence. Computer vision has a lot of really cool capabilities. Some of these can be de object detection, saying, hey, is this object in the image? It can tell you the location of the object in the image. It can tell you the number of objects in the image. It can tell you the color of the image, the resolution of the image. It can read text in the image. An example, the modules use, is say there's a marathon and you need to track the runners by their numbers. You could do that with computer vision because it can read those numbers and keep their times. Computer vision can analyze images and videos. Computer vision already has some really cool preset capabilities. One of them that stands out to me is it automatically has a database of a ton of global large companies brand logos and it can tell you the brand logo in a photo without having to do any additional design or testing as a user. Custom vision is gonna have a lot of the same capabilities as computer vision, it's just you're gonna to have to use your own images to test and validate that model. The Azure AI face system allows you to build facial detection and even facial recognition solutions. These facial detections are gonna detect simply if there is a face, the facial recognition can even determine whose face that is. It will say the more photos you provide, the more accurate or the higher confidence that it's gonna have in these predictions, but I think that's to be expected. This model can even detect faces and recognize faces with things like hats and sunglasses on. It's pretty cool. Document intelligence is gonna have to do with scanning documents or receipts and being able to automatically extract that information and put it where it needs to be. A super common example of this is expense reports and receipts. I feel like I got several questions in my practice problems or on my exam that were related to the user needs to scan a receipt. Which AI workload, which computer vision service should they use? It's document intelligence. The next AI workload is natural language processing and this is gonna be focused on interpreting either written or spoken language and providing a response. We have another four models underneath natural language processing. That is gonna be language, translator, speech, or bot service. The language model is gonna give you the ability to understand and analyze text in order to build intelligent applications. A good example of the Azure AI language service is gonna be sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis is gonna be able to determine how happy or unhappy the writer of a text is based off of their natural language. A good use case for this is looking at customer reviews. 
and you can use the language service to determine the sentiment analysis of all those views. And if the sentiment analysis were to be below a threshold, you could have an action taken, like say the manager of your store reaches out to that customer. Translate is gonna be pretty straightforward. This is gonna be used to determine the language that something is written in. It can also translate the language from something to another. Speech is gonna have two capabilities, speech analysis and speech synthesis. Speech analysis is taking speech to text and speech synthesis is taking text to speech. So speech analysis would be things like automatic closed captions where it's determining the language and it's creating the captions. Speech synthesis, would a great example would be where the automated machines are reading a script aloud. That would be speech synthesis. One note, if something is a spoken language that is different, what actually translate that is not gonna be translator, it's gonna be speech because it was spoken. That's gonna be a capability of speech, not translator. The last model of natural language processing is gonna be Azure AI Bot Service. Azure AI Bot Service is gonna be a bot framework to create a bot and manage it. It's gonna integrate backend services like language and connecting to channels for web chat, emails, teams, and others. Now when I first read this, I thought, oh, this sounds like Power Virtual Agents, but there is a little bit of a difference. It's something similar, but bot services is gonna be a little more technical as opposed to Power Virtual Agents is prefaced around being low code, no code. The last AI workload is knowledge mining. And knowledge mining is gonna be used to extract information from large volumes of either structured, semi-structured, or non-structured data to create a searchable knowledge store. And boom, we are done with the AI workloads. You're gonna get a lot of questions involving which workload or which model of a certain workload is going to be used in this situation. It's really important you know these, but in my opinion, a lot of them are fairly straightforward. And after a little bit of practice, you're gonna have it down. But hey, they're behind us now. If you've made it this far into the video, make sure you like and comment down below. I wanna hear any questions you have, any comments, even just on the video itself. I would love to hear any feedback you guys have. If it's over content related to the AI 900, let me hear that too. Let's hop right now into the AI principles. Microsoft has six overarching principles that are gonna outline their approach to their pursuit of new AI technologies and making sure their pursuit of them remains responsible. Microsoft believes that when you create these technologies, you must also ensure that the technology is developed and used responsibly. The six AI principles is founded on two perspectives, and that is that AI is ethical and that AI is explainable. The six key principles that Microsoft has outlined for responsible AI is fairness, reliability and safety, privacy and security, inclusiveness, transparency, and accountability. The fairness principle is founded on the belief that AI systems should treat all people fairly. This involves ensuring that the AI system allocates opportunities, resources, or information in ways that are just. Let me explain. If you get a question that suggests the output of an AI system is biased, that is gonna be in violation of the fairness principle. The fairness principle is gonna safeguard from systems being created using already biased data, and so then that way their outputs are not biased as well. Reliability and safety is gonna ensure that AI systems always perform as they're expected and safely for any of the users that are involved. An example of how to practice the reliability and safety principle would be implementing safeguards into your AI system that would not provide an output if fundamental input data was not provided. What does that mean? Let's go back to our hospital example. Say you're using an AI system to predict the diagnosis of different patients, but if that patient's temperature was never taken, you might wanna create a safeguard that is gonna say, hey, don't diagnose this patient if there's no temperature taken, because that may be something that is fundamental to the diagnosis. Privacy and security has everything to do with protecting the data that is either built or is currently being used by the AI system. The inclusiveness principle exercises that AI systems should empower and engage all people, even with different abilities. Not to be confused with fairness, inclusiveness has to do with the users of the system. The fairness principle has to do with more of the outputs or bias, like I said. Inclusiveness, an example of that could be, 
if the output, if the user is blind, the output would then be reading aloud using speech synthesis as opposed to just transcribing the text on the screen. The principle that says AI systems should be understandable is transparency. I got several questions involving, okay, you want this AI system to produce a document that states why it came to its conclusion? That is going to be transparency principle. This involves considering how people might misunderstand, misuse, or incorrectly estimate the capabilities of the system. The final AI principle is accountability, and this is going to have to do with that the creators and all people are generally responsible for the use and practice of AI systems. It also has to do with making sure that people are continuously overseeing these systems to making sure that they're still reliable and safe, privacy, and they still have privacy and security, they are still fair, etc. Those are the six AI principles. Microsoft is going to give you a lot of questions involving which principle does this validate and it may have a drop down or it's going to say the blank principle is yada yada yada. So it's going to be really important you understand those and so you can be successful on test day. I think it's important to note that before we get into our next section that this section begins to feel a little bit more technical but let me be honest with you. I did not personally get a ton of questions on my exam nor in my practice problems that dealt with the details of Azure OpenAI services. But I still wanted to share what they are just so you can be aware on test day because they are contained in the modules and is able to be on the exam. Now the last topic for today is Azure OpenAI services. We need to talk real briefly about a little bit of the history. ChatGBT, which has taken the world by storm since November 2022, is a generative AI system that works on a conversation basis. ChatGBT was created by a company named OpenAI, and now Azure has now partnered with OpenAI called the Azure OpenAI Services that bring some of these capabilities into Microsoft. The partnership contains four main capabilities. Number one, access to powerful language models. This is your ChatGBT type solutions. Number two, fine tuning. Azure OpenAI Services allows you to fine tune the models with your data and hyper parameters to increase the accuracy of outputs. Number three, responsible AI. Azure OpenAI Service has built in features to help you ensure you're using AI responsibly. And lastly, number four, enterprise grade security. Azure OpenAI Service runs on the Azure Global Infrastructure to meet your production needs such as critical enterprise security, compliance, and regional availability. The last thing to talk about related to Azure OpenAI Services is going to be the Azure OpenAI Studio. This is a web-based interface where you can build, test, and deploy your models for public consumption. Within Studio, you're going to have what's called Playgrounds. Playgrounds are interfaces that are created with a low or no code approach in order to test your models. You can play around and quickly iterate and experiment with the different capabilities and no worries. There's even an assistant drop down there to help you get started and answer any question that you have while building. My goodness, we made it. We covered so much content related to the AI 900, the Microsoft Azure AI Fundamentals certification. And I'm telling you, if this is where you started, you're in the right spot. Like I said in the beginning of the video, I'm still going to recommend that after this, you go knock out those learning modules and get some practice problem reps in. My name is Griffin Lickfeld, and thank you guys so much for sticking to the end of the video. If you have any questions over the AI 900, make sure you put them down in the comments section down below. I'm excited to respond and get interactive with you guys down there. As well, if you already took the exam, let me hear what you thought. What did you think was difficult on the exam? What did you do to prepare? What are some things you think I should include in this video? Let me hear them in the comments section down below. If you guys have any video ideas and content you want me to cover, let me know. And as always, see you in the next one.